exterior window cleaning session. Uh, we'll start our question and answer session now. Jack? I have a question about the cleaner you're using. Uh, I noticed that when I use Glass Clean 4 that I don't get as many suds on the windows as you seem to get. Are you using a Glass Clean 4 type cleaner or are you using more of a soap like a Dawn type cleaner? Uh, the actual cleaner I use, it, it, if I had to compare it, is probably more like a Glass Clean 4. Uh, it's probably uh, a lot stronger than that. That's why I use such a little amount. But the suds are actually coming from the phosphoric acid soap. It's not from the acid in the soap, but there's other things in that uh, phosphoric acid uh, that is causing the bubbles. Jim? Yeah. Uh, Dan, I had a question. When you were catching, you were doing your demonstration on this window here, you were catching uh, the debris on your Borsher's brush, and then you were going back over on an upstroke with uh, your brush. I was wondering, were you worried about uh, any of that uh, mortar scratching the glass when you that's, uh, that's another reason why we use window brushes rather than strip washers. With a window brush and, and the horse hair, you can get a lot, of, a lot of plaster and debris and grit on the brush. And when you put pressure on it, the debris will go around the bristles. To where using a strip washer, unfortunately, when you get debris in the strip washer, it gets stuck in the, in the, in the, uh, in the lamb's wool and it has nowhere to go. Also, the, the strip washers are much harder to wash out. I mean, you, you guys saw how much stuff I had in this brush, and now there isn't one grit of sand in it. It's very easy to clean out. But as far as dragging stuff, you don't push hard on it, otherwise you, you, would, you probably would scratch it. But, but, but as far as going lightly, when I uh, use the window brush, it's just mainly for spreading the acid and spreading the water. Uh, I don't use the window brush for scrubbing the glass. I don't want to scrub the glass when there's plaster and stucco on it. Same as on the inside. I don't want to scrub the glass when there's texture all over the glass. The texture won't hurt the glass, it won't scratch it, but by me scrubbing it, it turns it into like milk. And then, then it, I have just, just a mess where if I just wet it and soften it, then when I hit it with my scraper, I knock it off and all that stuff doesn't end up back in my water. Usually, if the texture is really heavy, I'll carry a second bucket, a junk bucket. And when I start scraping, instead of holding my window brush up like I did out here, I will hold the junk bucket up and I'll actually scrape 90% of it into my bucket. That way there, it doesn't end up in my water. Because if it ends up in my water, then I'm squeegeeing with dirty water and your squeegee marks show a lot more. You can leave a lot of squeegee marks on the windows and get away with it, as long as it's clean water or as long as you're putting your squeegee where the mutton bars are. Or put the squeegee, as I said before, that's why I start my squeegee up here. Even when I take my cut across here, all this is clean. Why don't I start my squeegee here? That's right in your line of sight. You'll be able to see them. But if I start it up here, if I happen to leave a squeegee mark, it's out of the line of sight. So that along the combination with making sure you have clean water. Take the time to empty your water, if you're, especially if you're a new window cleaner or just getting into construction. Don't, don't do more than one house. You might even do a half a house. Change your water. It doesn't take five minutes to change your water. Another thing I want to bring up, we do use phosphoric acid on these outsides. You always change water when you go from outside to in. You don't want to take any of, this, any of these chemicals that are in your water inside the house. You don't want to drip any water that has phosphoric acid in it on your stainless steel sinks or on your carpets. So you do need to, to, to clean out your water and your equipment before you go in the house. That's one reason why most of the time when we do windows, if we have inside and out, we always do the insides first. And then we do the outsides. Okay, I have one other question. When you uh, applied your uh, phosphoric acid, uh, and it was, you weren't afraid of it running down and etching the glass, before you got in because it looked like you got it real quick. Uh, phosphoric acid will not etch glass. Uh, th that you don't have a problem with. The only acid that will etch glass is uh, hydrofluoric acid. Uh, I, in, in the olden days I used a muriatic acid which I don't recommend. We don't use it anymore either. Uh, but I don't know of any other acid that will etch glass besides hydrofluoric. Hydrofluoric acid I do not recommend for anything, water spots or anything else. But we do have a water spot seminar coming up too. We do have some hydrofluoric acid. We'll show you some demonstrations on that. But uh, for construction cleaning, we use phosphoric acid. Hydrofluoric, we do not use. Some water spot uh, window cleaners do use it. And 
there is some drawbacks. Yeah, hi Dan. I'm wondering, I notice your uh, broad knife there. Is there any prep you do between going from the outside to the inside? Because it's a little crusty and dirty. No, uh, the, only, the only thing you should do is, is wash it off. You know, uh, with, if I was going to be shutting down now, which, which I'm going to be doing more windows, if I was going to be shutting down, I would have washed this off. I would also rinsed off my squeegee good because there is acid in that. And I would have took my belt off and put that in my bucket also. The only reason this isn't washed off is, is because I'm still going to be washing windows. But yes, this needs to be cleaned off. Otherwise, it will turn the broad. It doesn't hurt anything to turn the broad knife black. But uh, yeah, you, you definitely need to wash this off. Another thing is, is when you do decide to finally sharpen your, your putty knife, it, it's very important that you do clean the stuff off before you use your file. You don't want all this garbage filling up your file unless you want to buy a file every week. If you take care of that 12 inch mill file, it'll last forever. So this is the kind of stuff you need to clean off real good and make sure it's dry before you start sharpening uh, or flattening the end again. Okay. Larry? Dan, I actually have three questions. One is I encounter a lot of baked on uh, tape adhesive on the frames. Um, how do you typically, or do you typically address that a little bit differently than what you just showed us? Uh, usually when we run across that, uh, we have the plaster come back and take it off. If they have us do it, it is a painstaking effort to do it. Uh, the, little, the little putty knife sometimes works. Uh, believe it or not, if it's on there long enough where it gets good and dry, it'll scrape right off real nice. But sometimes you don't have that luxury of, of telling the builder, well, hey, why don't we wait six months and I'll come back and pop it off cheaper for you. Well, the homeowner's standing there and he needs it off now. So if it's still gummy and, and has a lot of resistance still to it, then uh, you will have to probably go to unfortunately maybe a solvent or go to a razor blade. If you're good with a razor blade and your angles, you can get most of it off with that and then come back with maybe some type of solvent on a rag. But as I said before, I'm not recommending any solvents. You might want to go to the, the window manufacturer, find out what they okay. But we have actually used uh, mild solvents on uh, small amounts of uh, tape debris. But usually we get most of it off before we use the solvents. Just solvent on a rag. Do not be pouring it on and do not let it run down into the IG unit area. But beyond that, uh, that that's the only way we can handle that. Thanks. My second question is, maybe it's more personal preference, but just like um, washer strips, the uh, wash brush comes in four or five different sizes. Is there um, something that's optimal for exterior? Uh, the window brush? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Size-wise, I like the 14. Uh, I, I've never tried a smaller one. I, I actually like uh, the 14 because I've been using it for 41 years. Uh, but going smaller would, would just make me have to go up and down an extra time. And going bigger, I think it'd be too big for me to handle as far as uh, on smaller windows. That's one, one thing I like about the size of that. The same thing with my squeegee. Uh, I, I know a lot of guys that'll say, you know, you got to have an 18, you got to have a 22. You gotta have a 36, you gotta have a 56, you know, or, or whatever it may be. I mean, you've got to get squeegee sizes that, that are gonna be practical for what you do. You know, if I do big 12 foot by 12 foot plates, well yeah, I, I wouldn't use these squeegees. I'd probably be up to a 22 or who knows, maybe something even bigger. I'm sure some of you guys have good suggestions for that. But for construction window cleaning on homes, this is the biggest window we hit usually. Custom home, you may have one, say this big. But I'm not going to carry around a 22-inch squeegee just so I can save two strokes on one window on a house. It just doesn't make any sense. With this squeegee, three hits, it's done. You know, if I go to an 18, sometimes I have a 16-inch window. Well, then, then I can't use an 18. So I found out over the years the best way to go is, a, is, is, a, is an 8 and a 14. And then usually the, the 8 I don't use very often. Sometimes they have little bathroom windows. You use, use you know, the 8 on that. But uh, four residential for us anyway, uh, the 14 and the 8th. So there is a reason we use the size we use. The window brushes, I'm not sure they come in too many different sizes beyond that. They, they, they might go to a 10. 10, 12, 14, 16. Oh, okay. That's what I've seen advertised. That oh, okay. Typically. Yeah. Uh, if I was starting, if you wanted to start, you could start with a 12. I wouldn't go any smaller than that. And I wouldn't go any bigger than a 14. Uh, because starting out, it's a little bit to handle. I mean, your arms get sore and, you know. Another thing is, is you'll notice. Uh, as I said before, when you clean out this window brush, it's so important to clean it out 
we have safety meetings here every other week, and we have tool check meetings to where I check my guys' tools. And if I pull a window brush out of their bucket, and I can take it and go like that and get much water out of it, that's not good. You need to get water out of your brush. Same as the sponges. If I pull the sponges out of their bucket and I squeeze them and get, get a lot of water out of them, that's all that moisture around all your stuff. And you, you don't want to do that. So I tell the guys, make sure you get all this stuff cleaned up. With some of the custom home builders that I work with, there are times just like when a contractor who needs power is on site, they need to bring their own. There are times when I encounter a, a, a custom home where for some reason the water is not on. So do you guys typically bring um, on board as part of your toolkit? In our, in our building in, in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, usually everything is there. Uh, before that time, we didn't have power, we didn't have water, we didn't have heat in the houses. Nowadays, I mean, they got air, they got heat. I mean, we're, we're walking in tall cotton now compared to what we used to do. But uh, every so often, we will hit, hit a job, a custom house or something, where they say, we don't have water, can you bring it? And usually what we'll do is we have these five-gallon buckets, and uh, they actually have, if you go to some catalogs uh, that sell these, this type of stuff, they actually have buckets that will snap on, and they have screw-on tops. And it works out great to be able to just put, put water in it, screw on the top, if it falls over in your truck, it doesn't go anywhere. Plus, during the winter time, I always tell my guys, take hot water. I don't care how cold it is outside. If you take hot water, it makes your day go really good. And hot water squeegees better than cold water. If it's a cold day and you're using hot water, squeegees great. It keeps your hands warm. Is that it? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Just one quick question. You mentioned, uh, you know, the mill file. Is that the, the, I mean, is there a different, uh, I mean, obviously there's a coarse file. Is there a perfect file to be using to file that down? Yeah, the, the, this is a fine 12-inch mill file, a fine 12-inch mill file. So it's a mill file, but it is the fine. They do have, yeah, they, they, they do have medium and coarse, but you want to fine, and you definitely want the 12-inch. They sell 8-inch uh, and 10-inch, uh, but I highly recommend the 12. It just gives you another 2 inches to shove that knife down. The 10 inch, you can just go a little short strokes. So you want to go to 12. Greg. Yeah, also one other question about your uh, phosphorus uh, fluid over there. Uh, how does that contend with silicone and how do you contend with silicone? The phosphoric acid really doesn't have any uh, effect on the silicone uh, that I know of. Uh, but that being said, the, uh, we don't have a whole lot of problem with silicone on our jobs. Most of the, of the windows that are on uh, the residential jobs we work on are production builders, and, and the windows they buy are production windows. So, so they, aren't, they aren't custom windows and custom frames. Uh, if you get into, uh, are you talking commercial? Either one, I'm just oh, yeah. wondering how you contend yeah. with it. Yeah, some, some uh, window manufacturers still use silicone. Uh, all the ones I have, they don't use silicone. So we actually don't run into silicone. Years ago, we did have a problem with that, where they weren't just, uh, I know uh, Likit windows uh, used to leave a big bead all the way around the window, and we used to have to cut that back, and it was a real trouble. They're no longer in business, but uh, uh, that was really hard to take care of. Plus, the guy had silicone on his hands, and he'd keep touching the glass. We had to get that off. And it just got to a point where we just told the builder, you know, you, we're going to charge you extra for that. It's going to cost you an extra hundred a house or, 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 or whatever it may be. And, and when the builder has to pay that extra buck, I say, all you have to do is tell that glazer to keep his hands off the windows. He should be delivering these windows without that silicone all over. So I'm going to charge you to do it, or you can tell him to, to clean up his act. And nine times out of ten, the builder's going to say, wait a minute, I'm going to talk to the glazer and, and uh, have him clean up his act. And, and usually that takes care of it, but in the last 10 years, I haven't, I haven't run into silicone at all. Uh, commercial, you will a little bit more, but uh, in residential, no. Larry. Dan, I've run into uh, putty on French doors with custom builders, so I, I've taken to using a glazer's tool. Is that typically yeah. what you guys use? Uh, we don't get a whole lot of that either, but we do run into that once in a while, usually on French doors. Uh, it's a single divided light French doors. And uh, usually what we do on that is we'll take our single razor blade, like this one, and, and we'll cut all the way around to cut it back. Then I'll take that little putty knife I had, and instead of putting that little right angle at the end, I'll just let it go all the way out to a point. And when you get done razor blading it back, you just take that point and just go all the way around. It just trims it off very nicely. 
But like I say, we don't run into it very often, but, but if and when we do, uh, that, that takes care of it quick, very quickly. Any more questions? Mike? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, when you were taking silicone off a of glass, how did you get it off? When we were taking it off, uh, what we would uh, typically do is uh, use a new razor blade, razor blade as much of the silicone off as you could, then we'd take a rag and, and use uh, some type of solvent. Usually it was lacquer thinner, and the solvent was, uh, or the silicone was so thin, it didn't take a whole lot of solvent to take off what was left. But a razor blade, a new razor blade, with some pretty good pressure will take off 98% of it. You'll still see the image where it was at, but, but if you come back with a solvent like lacquer thinner, it'll take the rest off. That, that being said though, uh, I remember years ago, we had some, a window manufacturer that had that problem and they had silicone on it. We went ahead and took it off for them and it, it looked good, but they actually hired a uh, tinting company to come in and put a liquid tint on the windows. And when they did that, the fingerprints came back out again and uh, they created a real problem. Uh, the manufacturer came out and what they used was white gas. They used white gas on the silicone and it took it right off. So, what, so, so, so white gas might be, well they didn't use a lot of it, they used it on a rag and only did, did, did the part that required it. But that seemed to have solved the problem. I don't know, I haven't, I haven't tried white gas. Okay. Yeah, is there a risk with the uh, using that white gas on the on the seals on the well, well, like I say, the uh, I've never used white gas, but but I know that they use this uh, on a very limited basis. It, if you had a handprint here, they would put some on a rag and, and, and just get the handprint off. They wouldn't pour it on the way I was pouring on that phosphoric acid and letting it run down. As I said earlier, I would not use any solvents, acids, chemicals, anything in, in, in a large amount that's going to be running down behind this frame. Back when I was doing window protection, I actually had to go through the Window Manufacturers Association and have the oil I was putting on these windows tested to see when it migrated behind here if it affected the, uh, the seals. And when they did that, they actually took an IG unit out of a window and put it in a trough of my protection for 30 days. Took it out, put it in a 140 degree oven for 30 days, and then set it out in the sun for 30 days. And then they washed it off and they said if they could tell the difference between that unit and a brand new one, they wouldn't okay it. And it didn't affect it. My product didn't affect it. But there was other things that came up beyond that. But, but the IG unit manufacturers will test the product. If, if they get a lot of windows that are breaking down at one time, they will do the testing. That's one reason why I got out of the window protection business with this oil. Other people came in with an inferior product that was eating up sealants and it ate up tons of them. And it was some real problems. So the window manufacturer just said, no more. They're not going to take a chance. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question on procedure. The way you were, on the way you were actually scraping the glass, is there a reason why you scrape down as opposed to sideways or up? Or? Uh, down, because I don't want to throw it up in my face and have this, the, the, uh, any of the debris go any higher. And, land all over me, so I'm trying to get it to come down, and I don't really want it on the glass above me. I want it to keep bringing everything down. As you notice, when I wet windows, I wet it from the top to the bottom also, you know. And, and, and when I wet windows, I'll wet windows, I'll start here, and I'll wet down this side, down this side, and then down the center, to where you save strokes doing that. Everything you do, when you do something for a long period of time, everything you do, every move you make, there's a reason you make it that way. Where I have window cleaners that I'm trying to teach, they'll put the brush on the window like this and just scrubby dub dub over the whole window, you know. And I'm going, what are you doing? You know, I don't care how you wet the window down, but but have a plan. And and to answer your question, the scraper's the same way. I don't care how you do it. You can scrape up if you want, but have a plan to where you're keeping track of of what you've done and where you're going. I've seen a lot of guys that'll start here and just go all the way over to here. And then start here and go all the way over to here. Well, that's fine. Just make sure you get every square inch of that window. That way there, you don't have to have a second window on the inside saying, hey, you missed a spot here, you missed a spot here. My window cleaners are trained. They can go in the dark and wash windows because they scrape every square inch. They know they didn't miss anything because they scraped every piece of the window. The same as squeegeeing. You don't really need that much light. You're not really watching the only time you're really watching what you're taking off is when there's a big old clump 
of concrete and you're watching that because when you go across it and hit it, it's, it's going to hurt your hand holding on to that knife. So usually I hit it pretty hard. So I mean, in that situation you are watching. But what I'm doing here, I wasn't even watching that debris. All I was watching is I need to make five inch passes with a six inch knife. Sometimes I can get to five and a half, but you don't want to push it too much because then if you leave something behind, you got to go back and pick up that one little, that, that, that one little bit. But scrape all the water off the glass. But how you do it, no, it doesn't matter. Just try to make yourself a pattern that works for you to where after you've done it so many times, after you've done 100 or 100,000 or how many ever it is, you aren't even paying attention anymore. I mean, your mind is a million miles away, a million miles away. Okay, that, that leads to my next question on the way you squeegee. Because you came over to the top, to the corner, and stopped. And I would think it would be quicker if you just came over to the corner and just started right straight down. You actually could. Uh, most most uh, window cleaners that, that do the, the fan or the trowel or, or whatever you guys call it, you, you can actually do that. But when you come across here and then come down, it, 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 it would actually save you one space. But what I'm trying to do is get this thing turned around as quick as I can so the water is being pulled away this way. That, that's your question? So, so you, you, can definitely save, you can definitely save some moves. That's why on, on this window here, when I squeegee down on all three strokes, I came all the way down I went all the way to the bottom. Where on this one here, sometimes I don't do that because this area here this area here is just too wide. Kind of like on the inside one is when you have window sills. You can't squeegee all the way down because you hit the window sill. But any time I can take advantage of that, I'm going to do that. It saves me one stroke. And one stroke's not much. But when you do 100 windows a day, that's an extra six windows. You're not working faster. You're working smarter. You're paying attention. <coughs> Jack? I know you're a creature of habit, and you have your... Um broad knife there on your uh, right hand side. I, I know we talked uh, before this and you said that some of your guys wear them behind themselves. Exactly. Uh, it, and it is creature of habit. Uh, and, and even me, if I, if I was back washing windows again, I need to put it in the back. Having it here, I like it here because I can get to it, but the disadvantage of having it here is, is when I'm picking up my bucket, I'm catching my arm on here and I'm putting little scratches in my arm. I don't have any yet, but I'm sure by the time the seminar is over, I will have scratches in my arm here. So my guys had the same problem when I was teaching them and they didn't like that. So they said, well, what we're gonna do, we're gonna switch it. So they, they put theirs in the back so they don't have to worry about that and they put their eight inch squeegee on the side. I just thought it might be a good hint for guys who are watching the video. Exactly. You, you, you definitely wanna put it in the back. If you start out that way, it, it's definitely the only way to go. The only way to go. It's kind of like my little knife. You know, the only way to go is put it on that clip. And I, and I said that, and as soon as I got out here to do it, into the bucket it went. You know, kind of like old dog, new tricks. So, Jason. How do you deal with um, pre-existing scratches when your guys are out cleaning windows on a regular, not, not a tempered glass, but just something maybe from the masons or something? Uh, pre-existing scratches, uh, most construction jobs, especially if they're as bad as these windows are, will have pre-existing scratches. The way I handle most of my uh, pre-existing scratch problems is my guys will uh, do a couple things. One is they all have worksheets that they go out during the day and they must report on their worksheet if they have a scratched window in a house. If it's more than one or two windows to where they're cleaning windows and it's a lot of scratches, they will call the office, call my office. My office will call the superintendent and bring them up to speed before we go too far. The advantage that I have on, on scratch glass is, is the builders we're working for build hundreds of houses. So, so the tracks are anywhere from 50 houses. I've got one builder, he's building 10,000 houses on one job. It's different phases and different style houses, but it's, it's huge. So when I run into scratch glass, if there's any question on it, I'm called out and I will go out and, and check the scratches and I can usually identify where they came from. But if not, I will go out to the houses we haven't cleaned yet. I'll go out to the houses they haven't painted yet. I'll go out to the houses that haven't been textured yet, haven't been sheetrocked yet, then all the way down to where they're delivering them on the job. And I will track down where they're coming from and I will show the superintendent where the scratches are and where I think they're coming from. But usually there's, there's a tall tale sign where they're coming from. And, and when I help the superintendent out, if you have a house with 10 windows with scratches and you say, okay, come on out, I'll show you what I found out. If you show them six or eight of them, the different ways that they had scratches, then he's not gonna worry about the other two. And I just say, I don't know where the other two came from. 
It might have been from a guy dropped his knife backwards, you know, mistakenly. You know, I don't know. But if he's doing it on a regular basis, I guarantee it'll be every window in the house. So it's just something small like that. But I usually try to tell my builders uh, as much as I can to help them out. Your texture guy's doing it. A lot of times what'll happen when they're, when they're wrapping a house, when they do stucco, the chicken wire and paper, they'll drag the chicken wire across the glass and that'll cause it. And I'll find that back where they're wrapping the house. See, I mean, who else could have did it? Or if they sheetrock in a house on the inside and they'll texture the walls, when they get done texturing the walls, what they'll do is they'll take a, a, a sanding block it's, it's about this big on a pole, and they sand all the texture down before they paint it. Well, they also sand down the window jam, and then they sand the corner down. Well, when they sand the corner down, the end of their pad hits the glass. And it took me almost two years to figure that one out. But, but I noticed there was scratches four to six inches all the way across the side, all the way across the top, and down this side here. There was none on the bottom. I'm going, well, why is there any on the bottom? Well, there's no sheet rock. That's, that's the windowsill. He only sanded the three sides, and it was six to eight inches. So we finally tracked that one down. But I had a hard time figuring it out because it was upstairs, but it wasn't downstairs. And you had the same guy doing the sanding. Well, I figured out finally why that was, because upstairs, this builder uses two by fours, and downstairs, he used two by sixes. And the two by sixes moved that wall out two more inches, and the pad didn't make it to the glass. So there's, the longer you stay in this, there's little tall tale signs that'll show where it's coming from. Most texture people, when they shoot texture, they'll cover the windows. Every once in a while, the cover will come off and he'll shoot maybe this much on a window. Well, the guy doesn't want to get in trouble, so he'll pull out his scabby looking scraper while it's wet and just knock it off. Well, the scraper didn't hurt it, the texture didn't hurt it, but it's such a scabby looking scraper, he's got rust all over it. And he left the lines on it because he didn't leave it clean, he just knocked off the big stuff. Well, I can look at the lines, and you have these lines. I just take my finger and go this way, and you can see the scratches going all the way through. Well, that's who caused that one. But there's, like I say, there's tall tale signs on all these different guys. I meant to show up before I cleaned off the plaster, but on that far window, I had plaster coming down like this that I actually rubbed myself. And if you take your finger and rub perpendicular to it, you can see the scratches going through. That's why a lot of these ones are so scratched, because we do rub the plaster around, and we obviously purposely scratch to show our guys what causes it. Because no matter how much you tell someone, don't do that because this is what happens, they give you the uh-huh, but until they see it, and then they see me pulling my knife backwards and they hear it scratching, they're going, hey, you know you're scratching that glass? I says, I do know that. I just want you to know that so you don't do it. So, so you, usually that's how we solve it. But if you help out your builder on scratches, they usually work with you. Yeah, I've, I've just found that sometimes on the initial cleaning, um, if you don't have that relationship with the builder and you, you come across a scratch on a window, you know, it's, it's locating the, the foreman or who's ever on site to point it out to them that, I mean, even if the window's dirty, it's like, do you go ahead and clean that window or do you, do you wait? I mean, obviously, if there's a big gouge or something. Usually if it's one window, I, I don't sweat it too much. I do contact someone and let them know about it. Uh, but you do make sure you let someone know. Uh, what I'm more concerned about than that is a lot of, especially the, the large builders, they will give you contracts and want you to sign off things that say things like, uh, you will be responsible for all the scratches on the glass unless you let me know about it before you clean them. I mean, you guys saw the condition of these windows. I mean, how am I supposed to find scratches on these windows when you can't even hardly find the window? I know it's here because it goes in a little bit. But beyond that, I would know there was a window here. So don't get yourself into them kind of situations to where you're going to sign a contract accepting responsibility for scratches that are already there. Because I just crossed that out. You also have terms like, this is a contract, but it's not limited to this. Well, what is it limited to? You know. So make sure you read your contracts. Another thing I highly suggest is, is make sure you read the other folks' contracts. When I sign a big contract, like for 10,000 houses, I, I need to know what he wants done. You want the windows, the tracks, the, what do you want me to do? So it gives me specifications. I want to see the specifications for the painter, for the plaster, for the texture guy. Is he supposed to be covering these things up? Yes, he is. But when you get a copy of his contract and then he doesn't do it, then you can go back and say, listen, I bid it according to all these contracts. Now these windows aren't covered. Most of the stuff I wouldn't even charge for. But if I had a hard to get along with builder, I would say, wait a minute. This guy's supposed to be covering this glass. I've got to charge you extra for this. And see, you, you, can, you can raise your prices and make up for some of the shortcomings you're getting on the other end. But the more information you can get, the better. 
But the longer you're in the business, the more of these things you will learn. One, one other quick question regarding using acids. If we don't have that product, do you recommend wearing gloves or something if you are using a phosphoric or, or similar acid? Uh, I actually recommend using, using uh, gloves for any acid. If, if I was going to do this long term or do it all day long, it wouldn't, hurt to, it wouldn't hurt to wear a set of gloves. It doesn't hurt to err on the safe side, uh, whether it's acid, whether it's uh, solvents. Uh, we used to use lacquer thinner a lot, and that was years ago when we didn't know any better. But nowadays, always, if there's any question, error on the side of the safety. It's not that hard to, to wear the gloves, you know. Otherwise, your hands are going to get really dry anyway. Matt? Do you uh, change any method for if you're second story, third story ladder work? Do you change your method at all? Or is it? Uh, no, the, the method we use for the second story is exactly the same as the first. The only thing we do is, uh, is our ladders do have what we call stabilizer bars on them. Uh, we, which I really favor them over ladders that come to points. I know a lot of window cleaners use uh, stack ladders and, and uh, ladders that they can stack and use, use it on a point of a corner. I'm not real big on them for a couple reasons. One is, is they'll flip easier and, and more importantly it, it, it actually puts you up against the window too close where by using a stabilizer bar it backs you up a good 12 inches or so which gives you much more reaching power too on both sides much, much safer. And then our stabilizer bars, we actually added a little, a little, uh, little shelf on there. So when we do second story windows, the only thing we do do different is we don't take the bucket up with us. What I'll do is grab four sponges, shove them down in the water, pull them out, half squeeze them, and take that up, and I use that for my water source. So I don't have to have a bucket on a belt or any of these other, any of these other things. This way here, I have fresh water on every window. And then when I get done, I throw them back in there, move my ladder, Grab the sponges again. This way you have plenty of, sp plenty of water. Use two of the sponges to wet down. Use the other two to wet down the second time before you uh, squeegee down. But beyond that, no, the scraping and squeegeeing is exa exactly the same. Any more questions? OK, that'll be the end of the exterior uh, construction window cleaning seminar. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, I'd like to uh, continue the construction window cleaning seminar. Uh, we're going to be doing some uh, inside windows. Again, I have uh, fresh water. I uh, cleaned out my bucket. Again, the amount of soap you use for inside window cleaning is uh, minimal. That should do it. Interior windows are a lot easier, in my opinion, than the exterior. Again, if you use a window brush, Make sure you hold it this way, not this way, especially if you're talking wood or carpet. Also, if you're doing a house where there is uh, finished floors, uh, I highly suggest you scrap carpet or uh, cardboard to lay down. Most of the houses that we do, uh, we do what we call a rough clean, which is before the carpet and before any of the flooring. So we'll come in and do all the inside windows throughout the whole house. They'll come in uh, a week or so later, put in all the flooring, then we come back, and then we clean the outside windows. And then on the final clean, we'll come in and give both sides a wash job. But anytime there's anything on the floor, always make sure you cover it up. Uh, and when you leave, leave the job as, as clean as the way you found it, which means not just the window, but any window sills, your aprons, the walls, baseboard. Okay. Key is just get water over the entire surface. That's all you're going for. You're not going to scrub the window. That's not what you're going for because then your, your, your water turns all milky. Depending on how much texture and paint is on the glass, you can either do it the same as you do the outside windows, scrape along the top, down one side, and then start your patterns. Or sometimes, if there's a lot of texture, a lot more than this, what you can do, let me grab my bucket here. You, 
you, you can actually grab a what I call a junk bucket and you can throw the major excess in a bucket. Of course that takes the extra time to scrape it once because you got to re-wet it and then scrape it entirely the second time. You're just going to get most of the big stuff off the glass. Something like this I don't bother using a junk bucket for. But if, it, if the texture's on really thick, then I suggest using the, using the bucket. Otherwise, all this stuff gets in your water and your water gets dirty really quick. Another thing I suggest is if you have a lot of texture on the glass where it's a lot thicker than this, uh, what we used to do is take uh, like uh, water pressure sprayers like using a garden. We fill them up full of water and put a little bit of soap in them and we go throughout the house and we wet all the windows down the entire house. And then when we come back to do the window cleaning, the stuff is so soft it just falls right off. I'm not going to use the junk bucket. There's really not that much stuff on these windows. As you see, I use about the same pattern every time. Again, doing the construction window cleaning, you can use a razor scraper or the old-fashioned way, a putty knife. These window frames are pretty clean, so I didn't bother uh, going through the cleaning on them. When we do that third window, uh, I will go through that for the uh, windows that are bad. It's important to know how to clean them and how to wet them down also. But on these first two, I'm not going to do that. I like to squeeze out several sponges before I start wiping down my window frames and squeegee in. Did you wipe down all the frames first? Then when your sponge is and you're about done and the sponge is dirty, rather than throw it in your bucket, what I like to do is try to get some, rid of some of this excess stuff now with this sponge because it isn't any good for anything else anyway. So you're not contaminated more sponges than you have to. Then I start squeegeeing. Same way, put the edge of your sponge along the window so you can pull the excess water out. Hesitate at the corner. Then on your last stroke, always go towards the center of the window. And I usually do a double take here. Never go this way because you run into your wall. Anytime you have windows like this with a handle out on the glass, the more difficult to do. All you can do is just kind of go around it. You can even touch it up later with a surgical towel. Usually what I'll do is go around and, and clip it at the top. Then the second stroke I'll come back around like that. That way you don't have to touch up much of anything at all. Usually when you get down to here, there's so much garbage and stuff here, I like to get most of that out rather than squeegee it up against my frame. See, all you have now there now is moisture. This is a little tougher too because this is a little wider. Then when you do your track, always start at the end and go to the center. Start at the end. Go to the center. Never start at the center and go to each end, otherwise you jam all the texture and stuff to both ends and you have a hard time getting it out. 
So always start at the end and move towards the center. When you're done, get your windowsill. It's very important, especially on stained windowsills. Make sure you get the front good. Up underneath, get your apron. Anything on the walls, your baseboard. Don't leave anything behind. Last thing you want to do is start a war with your painter. Okay? Patio door is about the same, just a little bigger, so I use a little more water on it. Try to use a lot of water, but only go over it one time. So I'll go across the top. Don't keep doing this because you muddy up the water. Across the top. Down the side. And, and try to get your strokes about the same distance. And having the mutton bars makes it kind of easy. It's important when you bring the scraper down at the bottom, you don't jam it into the frame because then you have a hard time getting all that stuff out. So stop just short. And then when you get done, your last stroke will come across this way. You'll find what distance works for you as far as these strokes. Some guys like to go a foot, some guys like to go two feet. But try to keep them at a reasonable distance, but whatever is comfortable for you. Wipe down your window frame first. Like I say, we're not going to clean the frames on this one. The last one, I'll go through that. See, so when you come down the window, angle your squeegee so the water goes this way, so you have control of your water. By sponging these edges, you shouldn't have to come back and do any touch-up.
Inside windows are a lot easier to clean than the outside as far as getting stuff off the glass because mo most of it's water soluble. For the outside you may have stucco to deal with, which means you got to get into the acid use. You might even have oil-based paints, which is a lot harder to get off than water-based. Usually on the inside, you don't have to deal with any of that. Say on your tracks, work from the ends to the center. And then when that's done, usually on the patio doors you don't have sills, but since this wall is raised up, we'll just pretend it's a short hardwood floor. And the last one. If you do have window frames that are uh, that need to be cleaned, you wet your window first, just like usual. Then you wet your frames so that can be soaking. Another advantage of using a window brush, handles a lot more water, so you can soak the texture or any water-based paint that gets on the frames. Once they're both soaked down, you can start scraping the window. Also, one thing I haven't gone over, when you hold your scraper or your, or your uh, broad knife, I usually hold it kind of like a ping pong paddle. It makes it to where you can go across the top easy, you can come down this way easy. It just makes it real easy if you, if you hold it like that. It just, just makes it real easy to have more uh, options. Once both windows are scraped, re-wet them. Then take your green pad and your little knife and clean your window frames. Starting in one spot in the corner. This is the little knife I was telling you about. It fits really good as far as knocking things off the frame. Usually I use my finger as a guide to run along the wall and it just rides right on up to the frame, taking everything off in its path. And it doesn't dig into the frame because it's not sharp, it's flattened off. When you get to the top, I turn it around and put this little right angle piece up in here to get anything out of the corners. And then use your green pad over the top of it, just to make sure you got any small things. Keep your green pad off your glass though. Once that side's done, then I do the top. But anything sticking up over the surface of the frame gets, gets popped right off. Because this, this uh, little putty knife is squared off. And then go over it again with your green pad. And it takes a while to get good at it. But practice makes perfect.
Usually I go ahead and take care of my my window track at the same time. Kind of helps to be able to use your green pad to dig out most of this garbage that's in the in the track because it kind of sticks to your green pad, so you don't have a whole lot to deal with. What's that? The uh, cleaning the frames. You bet. You wet your glass first, then wet your frames. And the reason you do it that way is that way when you're scraping your glass, your glass doesn't need this quite as much time to soak. You know, uh, you don't need the soak time. But on the frames, you do need soak time. So we wet the glass, wet the frames, then scrape the glass, re-wet the glass, and then when you come back and do your frames, it's a lot easier. But the little knife we use, it has this right angle on it to help you get down into these areas where it gets all the way to the corner. And lots of times where you have texture, it's down inside the corner and it's hard to get out. Well, with this, it makes it very easy. And you just bring it out six or eight inches. So let's clean up to there. Then what I do is use my finger as a guide and I just shove it right on up the side of the window and bring it down the other side like this. And the top, the same thing. This little right angle fits right in this corner. And usually, not on this one, but usually a lot of taping mud will be up in here when they tape this joint. So it, it makes it very easy to get that tape mud out of there. And you just run it right along the top, bring it back here, and you're, my daughter says you're good to go. Okay? And then from that point, wipe down your frame. Squeegee your window. Is that a little clearer? Okay. Where was I? Okay. This window frame's been cleaned. So once both the window has been scraped, and the window frame has been cleaned, you need to come back and sponge everything down. You always start out by sponging down the win window frames first. You notice when I do the window frames, I'll start in one spot and just go the whole distance without stopping. Most window cleaners, when they first start construction window cleaning, they'll, they'll do this or they'll do this. I don't know what that's about. Just start here and go all the way down. There's several advantages to doing it in one swipe. By doing it in one swipe, if you leave any dirt or there's any streaking, there'll be nice long streaks and you won't, it won't show. But, but if you get down to the end of the day and you're talking dirty water, when you go like this, you will see it. Maybe not head on, but you'll see it from the side, especially on white frames. And the hardest frames to clean are the dark anodized. Uh, I actually trained on dark anodized, you know, 40 years ago. And, and people think the white ones are hard. There are nothing to white ones compared to anodized. Anodized shows every one of these little white flecks. It makes it really tough. Okay, I'll squeegee this one down. Also, I should have showed you, when I'm doing my squeegeeing, I always wipe my squeegee off before I put it on the glass again. You must do that. Get the excess water off. Otherwise, you'll leave a mark where you set your squeegee down on the glass. Again, I wipe off all the junk off the glass before I squeegee it the last time. And I always go from the outside to the center. Once that one's done, and we have these lovely handles.
Each time you're done with the sponge and you're ready to throw it in your bucket, you might as well use it to pick up some of the garbage that's on here so you don't contaminate cleaner sponges doing it. That way you're getting all the garbage off the windowsill as you go. Rather than have to wait till you're completely done and then you got a lot of it on there. Not much you can do with these handles. That one I just went around without even stopping. And you can always come back later and do any touch up you want to do. But if you have a whole house of them handles, what I recommend is go around them like I did on that one and just keep going. I don't even carry a rag. Just keep going and when you're done with the house completely, then come back and touch it up. And the reason I like to wait to touch it up is because when you come back it's dry. And, and when you touch it up it won't smear. If you do it when it's wet, it does smear. You may not see it, but it, but it smears and then you can see it when the sun come, hits it at the right spot. You're done. Wipe off the windowsill one last time, making sure you get in the corners good. Underneath the windowsill, the apron, the walls. See here we have stuff on the outlet. Get that off in your baseboard. That's it. Any questions, anybody? Jim? Yeah, Dan, so when would you go back in, uh, open the window, and get the other side of the track? Uh, usually, the, the way we do our end of the construction window cleaning, like I say, we do three different cleanings. We do a, what we call a rough, a final, and a fluff. Uh, usually what we do, uh, the window cleaners uh, work with other, other cleaners, and usually they come in, the other cleaners come in first, who work for us, and we actually come in pop this window out completely, vacuum the tracks out, put the window back in, and uh, as far as sponging this one after, on the final clean we do do that. On the rough clean we don't bother because we're going to re-clean the windows again and junk's going to get down there again a second time. And, and if we vacuum all the garbage out and it's pretty clean, we don't really worry about that until the final clean. But on the final clean, yes, uh, when we come back and just do a wash job, we vacuum them again, we do the wash job, we sponge this side out, open it up, sponge that side out, then we close it, we hit this one one more time, because usually it takes water back and forth. Yeah, so what you, you're actually cleaning this one three times then? Uh, initial, actually, I, I, actually, what we do to save our contractor money, they, they try to get us signed up for three window cleanings, and I tell them that it'd be cheaper to do two, and the way we do it is we do the rough clean, which is just the inside windows on the rough clean before the carpet. And then on the final clean, that's after the carpet. On that clean, we only do the outside windows. And then on the fluff clean, which is, which is when they walk the house with the homeowner, we come back and we reclaim both sides. So, so they actually get two complete window cleanings. We are doing windows three different times, but uh, a lot of times the builder wants the outsides done even on a rough clean, and that's fine. But I'll be more than happy to oblige. You know, but, but I, usually there's a lot of contracts we sign, that's the way they want it. And usually I'll talk to the superintendent who's running the job and say, listen, this guy's throwing away $110 or $140 a house. Uh, if there's other things you'd like us to do, you're the guy I'm trying to please here because you're the guy trying to get the, you know, the house signed off. So usually we'll, we'll work deals with him where we will not do the outsides on the first one. And then if he needs some favors down the line where he needs a house recleaned or something like that, or Maybe we fluffed the house and then before the walkthrough, carpenters went in there and, and, and messed it up. He says, hey, Dan, I'd like you to go over to lot 23 and take care of that for me. You know, we send two guys over there for an hour, no problem. But I find out it works much better that way because that way there you're working together, you know, rather than me always saying I'm only going to do what's in the contract and him always saying you're going to do what's in the contract. I read your contract the other day and this is what you're supposed to do. 
you know, you're much better off trying to work with your builder. And uh, the office, the big thing they concentrate on is, is the dollar. You gotta get to them, you gotta get by the dollar. If they accept your bid, they are really out of the picture. The one you need to please is the superintendent. If you please the superintendent, the next project that comes up, if you've done 70 houses and then they start another project, the office is gonna ask that superintendent, hey, you had fields on that last cleaning, how were they? Did they get the job done or they didn't get the job done? Office doesn't know if it was done at all. All they know is if they hear complaints, either from homeowners on walkthroughs or from the superintendent saying, I don't want this cleaner again, then you got a problem. So if you please the superintendent after you have the contract, that's the key. I tell most of my builders, I really don't care about the specifications once I'm in. I will work with the superintendent and we can adjust, we can trade, because it's to his best benefit if he needs me to do some trading. So we will do some trading. And we'll put it in our database, you know, exactly what it is we traded. And we do keep close track of what's going on. And usually we come out on the high side of it. So it's just a way to, to pick up a couple extra bucks. But kind of like vacuuming the tracks and stuff out. You know, they, they want the tracks vacuumed out all three times. I mean, it's silly. You know, we vacuum out the first time because all the sheetrock dust and sawdust and cutting the rafters and all that. But I mean, after that, it's silly to do it the second time. But it's very important to do it on a fluff clean because when a homeowner comes through and walks the house, it's like checking the ashtray in your new car. You know, if there's a cigarette butt in there, we have a problem. So, okay, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, right. Any more questions? The, uh, <clears throat> a lot of construction is different in different parts of the, the um, states. I know in our area we have very few houses that have the texture like that. Ours is more of a problem with paint. Um, now, does the, does the uh, method that you're using with the broad knife and the, and the um, uh, soap solution work on, uh, work on paint? Yeah, the, the, the paint you're talking about, uh, if it's, if it's a wall paint, it's usually not a problem, it's all water-based. Uh, I know a couple gentlemen was talking earlier today about, about uh, a lot of their windows have all wood here, same as this, all here, all here, to where if the paint is from that, it's probably more of an enamel, it's a little harder to get off. If it's just a, a little bit you know, thrown on there, the broad knife will cut it right off. If it gets down to where it's pretty thick, usually it'll take that off too. But if it gets down to where it's very thick and pretty wide, what I usually do is just pop off my razor blade. After I've wet everything, if I see a big, big thing of paint, I know it's really thick and I'm gonna have trouble with it, I just take my razor blade and I just make like five passes through it to just kind of break it up. Then I just re-wet it and I take the broad knife to it. But, but by the time I'm hitting it with this here, I'm reaching for the knife. And by the time I get to the edge of that little circle, I'm coming back this way. I don't even rewet the window. So it just makes it easier so I don't jam up on it, you know. But yeah, it, it, it will take. The only thing the broad knife is, is not any good for, and that's the, the, the only drawback I know, is if you're trying to take off stickers or you're trying to take off tape. What, varnish? Uh, or varnish. We, we, we've actually done varnish with broad knives, but uh, someone was asking earlier uh, how often you have to sharpen your, your broad knife. Uh, years ago, they don't have it now as much, where they build in cabinets in the kitchen and, and they actually spray them in place. Uh, nowadays, they don't do that in production houses, but years ago, they did. And, and, and sure as heck, uh, you had a kitchen window here with a counter and you had a cabinet here and a cabinet over here. Well, when they sprayed them things, they, this kitchen window was just solid, solid varnish. Well, even with that, what I would do is, is wet it down, t take my little razor blade, and I may just hit it like about like that, and, and then, then come back with my scraper. But that's where it's key to have a sharp scraper. If you've cleaned a house and you hit that window last, the scraper ain't gonna do it. Where, where the razor scraper would definitely have an advantage. The only thing with the razor scraper though is since the razor comes to a point, if you have any nicks on that at all, it doesn't scratch the glass, but it'll let that varnish go through and you'll have lines of varnish here you missed. Which is no big deal. You just go back and scrape it a second time. You know, that, that, that's not that big of a deal. But, but yes, it can do it. You just have to make sure it's, it's sharp. That's all. What we used to do when we knew we had this, we'd start at the beginning of the day and we knew we had this problem and we knew it, it took a sharp knife, we started on this window. And after a while, you, you learn these little bit of tricks. You know, I have one tough window in the house. I want, I want my blade the sharpest on that window. The rest, it doesn't matter. So you start here. But uh, anyway. Is that it? Did that answer your question? Larry. So Dan, apologies. This 
should have been asked during the uh, exterior seminar, but... Oh, the, it's too late now, then. <laughs> the uh, phosphoric acid um, solution, is that safe and effective on either clear or anodized um, aluminum uh, uh, frames, winter frames? Uh, I, I would not recommend it. Uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't use it. But, but, but I would not recommend it. Uh, like I said before, we used to use, years ago, we used to use uh, muriatic acid on anodized. And I'm talking 100%. But we knew we had roughly uh, 30 seconds to get it off. Currently, I use a, a paint, I'll, I'll leave out the name brand, yeah. but a paint remover for thresholds. Yeah. But if there's um, stucco or any product like that, it, I actually think your your uh, the the solvents like the paint whatever solvent you're talking about that has absolutely no effect on uh, stucco concrete plaster or anything like that. Uh, when, when we break down our soaps and chemicals, the phosphoric acid only thing that'll help you on is anything with a with a cement base. So anything with a cement base that'll that'll dissolve the cement so it'll make the concrete let go. It has absolutely no effect on paint or texture. No matter how much you use on that, you're just, you're just throwing it away. No, it's a combination of contamination, but it's the elbow grease, obviously, that's... that's the, uh, I've noticed we used to do anodized metal uh, with different acids. Uh, you, you could actually, I think what I would do in your case is what we used to do is I think I would try to clean it off the best you could with a green pad or, or a knife as long as it didn't scratch it. And then once you get most of it off, you will have uh, what they call an effervescent stain. And if you use just a small amount on a sponge and go over it, usually that takes the effervescence right off. We've actually had jobs where we've been called back after a hard rain during the winter, and the effervescence from the stucco, which is kind of like effervescence from brick, for some reason some stuccos, the water will hit the stucco and it'll run down on the glass and bring the minerals from the, from the stucco down on the glass. And they want us to come back and take that off for them. And, and you know, they pay us extra for it. And uh, that's what we use is, is uh, the, the same acid we use here, the uh, phosphoric acid, and it takes it right off. And that's the same thing you're going to have to worry about taking off on that, uh, the anodized. And it's not so much the window frames, it's, I'm sorry, it's the um, threshold. What is the threshold made of? Typically it's anodized. Anodized? Dark yeah. anodized. Right. Yeah, the windows we used to do years ago was the same, dark anodized. The problem with, with using any chemicals or any acids on anodized, you're taking a chance. I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. Uh, but, but I think I'd test one because you don't have a whole lot of options. Uh, usually when we run into that, we do use the pink soap. Pink soap with our little knife and a green pad and just, just go for it. Uh, nine times out of ten, they, they repaint them anyway. Uh, or they use shoe polish. There's a thousand different things these guys do and I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, what we just started a couple years ago for thresholds, uh, we do so many houses and it takes us probably 20 minutes to a half hour to clean a threshold. So what we finally decided to do is we, we made up little threshold boards that we kneel down on that has black plumber's tape, it's two inches wide with a little rack. And what we do is go out during the framing stage and we cover them up. And um, so typically they ship with you know, clear plastic or bluish plastic. It doesn't depending hold up. On who the who the subs are, we pull that off. It gets all tore up. Yeah, th that's what we do. We pull that off because we know it's not going to hold up. So in the end, it cost me about a dollar for the tape, and it cost me about three minutes f to protect it. And by doing that, on the finish end, when I get there, I just reach and I peel it off, and you got a brand new threshold. Now with that happening, I've saved 24 minutes of my guy's time. So, so I picked up, I made some money there, but I also go back to the builder and tell the builder, listen, how much do you pay the painter to go back and paint that? And usually they have hour, hour and a half because they've got to mask everything off to do it. They, they've got to make sure it's pristine, clean, and, and, and does a lousy job. Where this way here, I'm giving his anodized back again. So when it's bidding time, the money you're paying, the, you know, you, you're saying I'm $30 over? Hey, I'm saving you $30 just on the painter. You're not having to hire the painter for that. And we do a lot of things like that in our company uh, that are freebies as far as the, 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 uh, the builder's concerned. But believe me, I benefit on the other end, like the thresholds I benefit. Another thing I benefit on that reminds me, we do the final cleans. These little water boxes that go behind refrigerators, I just put it here as an example, because obviously I can't put a refrigerator here. But uh, what we do with these is, is when we come through and do the thresholds, they don't have these covers on. These, these pop off. 
and usually we cover them up too. So instead of having to clean them, and, and, and there's little paint and stuff all over this little knob, I mean, you know, it takes just 30 minutes to clean them. When we get done, it still looks terrible. Well, this way here, we come through, we're doing the threshold. We go from there, walk through here, just put a cover on it, keep right on walking. What about door hinges? Uh, door, the door hinges is uh, the painter's responsibility on my jobs. But, but uh, these things, we, we've added a little at a time as you're, I've been in business a long time, so we've added them a little bit at a time. Uh, another thing we do is lot number signs. Uh, when you do a house, usually they write the lot number on the window. When we do the windows, it's gone. So what we do is have computer-generated lot number signs that has the job name, their logo, and the lot number. So when we clean the windows, we put the lot number signs on. And everybody loves it, not just the builder, but all the subs love it because they, they can see what lot number it is. Every house has a lot number on it. Then we go a step beyond that and we tell them, hey, if you want laminated lot number signs, we'll give you laminated ones with all the information you want, the plan number, the type number, the lot number, and you can put it on your foundation. And that costs us about 50 cents a piece. But yet, these are the little things that separate you from the competition. And we've got about 12 of them things that, that cost us almost nothing, but yet it separates you from the competition. The superintendents love it. Okay? Yeah. Dan, have you ever run into situations where the interior windows have been sprayed or lubricated with WD-40 or some type of lubrication? Yes, I have. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but yes, I, I have run into that. Usually I go from, from that window directly to the superintendent and, and, and we track down who's doing it. Uh, the only thing you can do on a situation like that, the uh, blue soap that I use is some pretty strong stuff. And instead of giving it a squirt, I give it a squirt. And, and, and then we usually person, use some pretty aggressive soap. It'll, it'll cut the, the grease. But we put a stop to it. Usually a house or two, I'll absorb it. You know, I don't want to be too hard. But then after that, I just tell them, uh, hey, this has to stop. Uh, I had a job the other day that we had a problem like that. But instead of, instead of uh, uh, oil to keep the stuff from sticking, they used, uh, you won't believe this, they used spray glue. Okay. And what they did is they came in, I'll go over here and do it. They actually came in and they took spray glue and they sprayed the glass like this. Then they took newspaper and they flopped it on the glass. See there, now it's protected. So we were actually fighting that for a while. I mean, I'm not sure what the guy was thinking. Maybe he needs to change his brand of smoke or something. I don't know, but <laughs> something is definitely wrong there. But that cost him. We actually, we actually had to bring out the razor scrapers on that. We do have razor scrapers here on special occasions where someone goes crazy. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, that material that's like a black rubber with a real sticky back to it. They use it on roofs sometimes. Sometimes they use it around windows on the outside to seal the frame to the house. Uh, they call it like bitchethane, I think. That stuff, it sticks, it don't let go. We had a couple of kids come in the house one time that actually stuck it to the glass, this whole house on the inside. And they hired us to come out and take it off. And, and the razor scrapers was the only way we could do it. And it took us hours and hours and hours. That stuff just doesn't let go. But it's, it's funny the things you run into. It's, it's like, what are they thinking? They're not. <laughs> you know, and yet here we are, the ones that they're calling, hey, you're the window cleaner. Now you're the expert. Where before you don't know what you're talking about. But, but when they need you, now you're the expert. Any more questions? Anybody? Okay, that'll end the construction window cleaning seminar. Thanks a lot for coming.